Commissioner, Department of Public Safety, Sean Tindall. Good morning, sir. How are you, Commissioner? Doing good this morning. How you doing, Paul? I just posted, doing good, just posted this other than allergies, and they just, they're, they're crazy. But um, just posted this on X in the, at Paul Gallo Show, the officers who have died in the line of duty in our state. Yeah. I did not realize it was that many. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a <clears throat> very dangerous job, very important job, and one in which those officers not only have to deal with a lot of difficult circumstances yes. uh, day in and day out, it's one in which you know can take their life, and they won't come home to their family. I think we've had over over 300, I know. Uh, I think it's – I forgot the exact number, but, you know, year over year, every year that I've been here, yeah. um, we, we routinely had to show up and meet with families that have lost a, a loved one in the line of duty, and um, – and you know you got little kids on the porch and and mom and inside crying it's uh th- those are very challenging um situations and and it's you know th- really the importance of this week uh as we have these memorial services across the state uh is taking time to remember these heroes yeah. uh, that have sacrificed i've always looked at it is no different than uh as far as this first responder than a soldier the enemy happens to be the bad guy but other than that, they're putting themselves into combat situations, in most cases, not prepared for it. I mean, prepared where you don't see the enemy coming. It, and a lot of these things, for instance, in domestic disputes, you can go up to a door, you can knock on it, she could offer you cookies and leave, or you could have a shootout in the next five seconds. That's the Soto a- County Sheriff's Office in Hernando, 10 fallen officers, didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. Your larger departments, uh, Department of Public Safety, we've had thirty-eight um, over the years, and and so it's uh, mm-hmm. and, and the larger the population, the more you're dealing with the yes. different circumstances, yeah. and and of course they're south of Memphis, um, and and you've got some some of that uh, fall over from from there, but it's a uh, it's just one of those jobs you never know what you're going to encounter, and it and particularly you talked about domestics. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are one of the most deadliest situations that officers can find themselves in because emotions are, are you know exacerbated, and then you've got somebody that that might be abusing a spouse that that is uh, you know unhinged anyway, and so when the officers get there, they just go ahead and uh, continue the fight, and so. Um, yeah, it, it's you know you think about the military; they know the enemy. Uh, they yes. know who their enemies yeah. are, and and so unfortunately, the the danger isn't always uh, clear when 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 it's dealing with law enforcement. And thank God we still have some young men and women who want to get into it. If you look at uh, the stats, you say you sure you, you sure you want to do this. You're a lot better off as an accountant, I'll tell you, because the uh, assault for automobile these are, these are lo- deaths in the line of duty. Automobile crashes, 43. Uh, accountants are not going to drive that way back to the office. COVID-19 at 7. Uh, we had 216 from gunfire. Nine heart attack, nine, nine motorcycle crash, stabbed, 7. Stuck, struck by a train, 4. Struck by vehicle, 17. And I'm not going to go through the whole list. But, I mean, it is, it's a profession that when you leave home in the morning, you, uh, you're – you, you're taking a lot of risk. Well, look, uh, you know, I had a dear friend of mine back in September um, mm-hmm. died in the line of duty, assisting a motorist that that had been in a car wreck. And, um, you know, I think most folks see those accidents on the side of the road and, and they yeah. wait for the first responders to get there and they keep going on about their way. First responders get out of their car and they go help. And, and, yes. they, and they rush to the yeah. scene. And, and that's what happened uh, in, in this particular situation, uh, Mike Griffin uh, showed up at a, at a car accident, tried to help the motorist, and, and the car slips into uh, reverse and, and rolls over him and kills him. And so, you know, he died a hero. He, he was trying to help somebody when most people would just drive drive on by and go on about their day. And uh, and, and that happens all the time in the first responder world, um, whether it's firemen or, or uh, law enforcement. Uh, they're, they're going to the danger and, and unfortunately sometimes end up uh, – you know, losing their life or, or getting injured in the line of duty. So uh, I was really proud this session. Uh, we had been working for the last two or three years trying to get uh, death benefits established so that funeral expenses for first responders would be covered. Uh, I've spent you know some time over the last few years whenever 
uh, an officer goes down or a, law, a first responder uh, is killed trying to raise money just to cover their funeral expenses. Yes. And yeah. so this bill this year covers that. Uh, we also, with the leadership of the House and the Senate, increased the death benefits uh, from 100 to up to $250,000. Um, for for fallen officers and their families, so that you know their f children can have an opportunity to go into college and and have their uh, house mortgage paid and 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 hopefully get them the head start in life that they deserve after losing a loved one. Um, I think that also included firemen, did it not? It did. It did. It was okay. all uh, all first responders. Um, and so, mm -hmm. um, and, and they've got to be state employees. So that's one of the challenges when we think about our EMTs, yeah. and and they're also <clears throat> first responders, but they work for private companies. So this only covers our public employees. I'm just wondering, John, when you talk to some of the the people who've been there for a long time, some of the veterans, maybe a few years away from retirement. And do they sit down and talk to you how much it's changed the interaction with uh, with the people out there on the road? They do. And, you know, I think there's a uh, prevalence, particularly since 2018, 19, 20, um, when you had some of the defund police movements and, yeah. and, and that, that that created this uh, pushback on law enforcement that, that I think was unjustified. And, and, and I've told different groups, you know, my dad was a Vietnam veteran who uh, came back and, and mm -hmm. he, he was a hundred percent disabled. And he said a lot of the things that caused him problems over there that he, that he, you know, saw and, and was involved with uh, the way he was treated when he got home uh, had a much greater impact on him emotionally. And yes. so I, I think the way that we've treated these law enforcement officers uh, and particularly in some parts of the country, um, there's going to have to be a reckoning that this country uh, pays them a, a debt of gratitude and recognizes that, you know, they, they got caught up in a, a political gamesmanship that I think did severe damage to their emotional state and, and the reputation of law enforcement because these men and women, none of them go into the job trying to make money, uh, you know, for the wrong reasons. They do it because they believe in their communities and they want to make them safer. And and so for that, you know, we need to pay them um, a justifiable salary that they don't have to work multiple jobs. And we also need to give them the training. Um, and we need to make sure that if we do have some bad law enforcement officers, that, that we get them out of the profession so that they don't ruin the the good name of the ones that that are out there doing it day in and day out for all the right reasons. I had a conversation, it's been a while back, and I said, look, here, here and we were talking about these sovereign citizens and everything. I said, the, the, the truth of this statistically, you're not going to win. You can push back, you can be angry and everything else. You've got a much, much better chance of this being a, uh, a, a better outcome for you if you just do a couple of different things. First of all, if you're stopped, day term or night time, roll your window down, put your hands on the steering wheel, have your stuff ready as far as your insurance and your license. Have that ready. And if it's at nighttime, do the same thing and turn your dome light on. Man, I, 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 how many people would just appreciate that? You come up to the car in the middle of the night on a deserted road somewhere. You've, they can see in the vehicle. It's going to be a lot better for them. And if you treat them as somebody's son, daughter, husband, wife, and look at it that way, you're going to run into some bad cops. But if you do, the, the outcome is still going to be bad for you. That's right. You, you you can you can take that through adjudication processes later on. Well, and that's what I try to explain to people. There's the the time to argue isn't on the side of the road. Um, that's that's why we have our court system. And and you know it's it's one of the things that's made this country uh, great. You're innocent until proven guilty. Um, and so if you're charged with something, uh, uh -huh. you will have a court date and you can present your case to the court. And, and an independent judge will decide whether or not uh, you're guilty or not. And so. Um, you know, and, and we try to emphasize to our officers de-escalation and, and how we interact with people is important, too. And, and so, um, you know, and I think we're getting better with that. And, and another part of this uh, and, and another bill that I'm extremely proud of that, that was brought on board this year is, is creating mm -hmm. mandatory driver's education in our state. And, and a component of that is going to be law enforcement going into classrooms and Thank talking you. about the interaction. Uh, so. Listen, I think that is so critical. I do. I think that will save it's going to save more lives, uh, more griefs than being able to learn pottery in school. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic about this, but it's something that will turn into um, an experience that may save their life or save them a lot of grief. 
There's no doubt. And, you know, statistically, Mississippi is usually number one or two, maybe three, over mm-hmm. the last 30 years in teenage fatalities on our roadways. Yep. Um, and you start looking at ways that we can solve it. And, 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 and look, I've got a 16-year-old who, who just uh, got his license uh, over the last year, and his high school didn't offer driver's ed at the time. And, yeah. and I'm watching him drive going, oh, my gosh, we've got, we, we got to have mandatory driver ed. Yeah. We, we, we started ours at 12 years old, 9 years old on the on the. Uh, four tractor but we we didn't get a lot of stop signs out there so we still needed it i want to ask you more about that when's that going to be implemented how fast this next school year or when when we come back with sean tindall commissioner department of public safety next <laughs> you ain't right oh <laughs> uh, that's our mississippi guy jeff bates too by the way i think he's from columbia uh, around Columbia, Jeff does a great job, man. He, I mean, he, he ought to be number one on the charts for a long time. I, I bet he's a proponent for uh, mandatory driver's education. Seatbelts like. for sure, wouldn't you think? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Uh, I mentioned this uh, on our ex at Paul Gallo show, and if you're not there, please join us. But top three most dangerous months in the state of Mississippi for law enforcement. Uh, number three is September, almost double. September, 35 deaths. We've had December, 41. And then the month of May, 42. No, uh, May is number one at 42. Hmm. You know, so why, why, why would you think just spring? Or we- yeah, I mean, just what we see. Um, and, and, you know, I get calls whenever we have officer-involved shootings across the state or MBI's involved investigations. And, and whenever it starts warming up and the days get longer, yeah. uh, you know, people might be having a few more drinks a little bit later, a little bit earlier. It just kind of uh, seems like there's a spike in, in violent crimes, um, and not just the ones involving officers, but just in violent crimes in general when you, when you start getting to the summer. Doc in uh, Gillsburg said, driver's ed was the best money my parents ever spent. I've been driving for 35 years now, and, and I've encountered literally every situation driver's ed warned me about and prepared me for. Blowouts, brakes, uh, failing, hydroplaning, love the fact it's mandatory. Just hope we get some good teachers. Well, m- most of the time, these guys or gals who are driver's ed people uh, have to be have nerves of steel, to, to be honest with you. But when when does that start? Is it going to be next school year? Can we do it that soon? It's the 26-27 school year uh, that it'll actually okay. start over the next year. Um, the uh, uh, superintendent uh, for the Department of Education uh, and I will get together and formulate the program. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we'll also have to look at ways that we can uh, institute a program, not just for uh, students in high schools, but for any driver that has never had a driver's license. Uh, we'll have to show proof of taking some sort of driver's education course. So we'll have to set the curriculum for adults as well uh, that might have never gotten a driver's license. And so uh, most of it's already in place. There is a program that schools already offer voluntarily um, when it comes to uh, uh, driver's ed. But we also need to be looking at the funding aspect. You know, some of these smaller school districts, how do they uh, you know, afford you know, the driver's education car? If everybody's having to take it, how many more teachers do we need teaching it? Um, so we're going to do a deep dive into those things, working together, and then hopefully come back to the legislature next year. And, and if there are any financial needs, let them know what those are yeah. um, and, and try to address that. So uh, part, the part of this is a phase in. And then, you know, we've also can't just do it July 1st. We, we've, we've got to give people an opportunity to take the classes before uh, we actually make that a condition of getting your license. But, but look, it, it's a step in the right direction. And you mentioned it earlier, saving lives. And, and when I would meet with mm-hmm. legislators about it, I would say, look, this is one of those bills. Um, you're not going to know whose life you saved. But you're going to know when you look yep. at the t- statistics, and we're no longer one or two in the nation, uh, there's some kid, some adult out there that their life has been saved because of these driver's education programs that we're going to be doing. And um, I, I got to give credit to some of the legislative leadership. Uh, Senate, Senator Dennis DeBar uh, was the author of the bill and, and a proponent of it. And on the House side, working with Rob Robertson and and mm-hmm. uh, uh, some of the folks over there, it really, Kent McCarty and, and Jansen Owen really kind of took the took the, you know, bull by the horns and ran with it on that side so um, i think it's a great piece of legislation a step in the right direction and and it's going to save lives and and I, i'm proud to be a, a part of it i don't think you could do this too soon uh as far as certainly the classroom part of that and that could start earlier the the vehicles the thing is going to be the does that have to be does it have to be a customized vehicle do you have to have the steering wheel also uh in the uh 
on the other side. At a minimum, you got to have the brakes, and, and I think uh, th that's the mandatory component of it is having the brakes. Do we have any um, idea what that cost is? It. Uh, we do, and, and I don't know the exact number if we were looking at bringing them, one of those to every school. Uh, the yeah. schools that already offer it have them. Uh, I've talked to some of the school districts that, that already have them, and, and they've also started anticipating, look, we might need a couple of more because every student here is going to be taking this class. And I was going to say, some of these classes are rather large. Absolutely. So, I mean, how do you do that? What do you put them in there five minutes? I mean, you gotta you got to give them a little time. Well, that's it. And so it becomes basically a semester-long program uh, that yeah. they're taking. But there, there's going to be some other components of it, you know, and I talked a little bit about it, law enforcement coming in and having an interaction yeah. plan, talking about, uh, you know, what, what what you should do when you get stopped. And so it's not all going to be time on the road. There, there will be yeah. some classroom time with it, and they can alternate road time uh, with classroom time and, and get everybody uh, some of the educational components that they need. And, and, and we talked a little bit about it earlier, interaction with law enforcement. You know, one of the things that, that we've tried to emphasize and that we need to do a better job of, and I, I've talked to our highway patrol and local police departments about, is getting into the classroom. All too often, these young people have never had any interaction with law enforcement until they get yeah. stopped on the side of the road. And, and unfortunately, they haven't had a mom or dad that have kind of gone through those scenarios with them. Um, so we're going to get into the classrooms, and we're going to let that first interaction with these students be a positive one, one in which, you know, they learn that we're not here to hurt you, we're here to help you, we're here to try to keep people safe, and, and this is how the interaction should go. And so um, they are establishing some of their beliefs of far as laws from social media from a young age. I don't have to roll down my window. I don't have to show you this. I can do this. I can't do that. And, and that's deadly to these I think and this sounds like grandfatherly advice, but but to me, what happens when I see these on social media, it's it's an extension of just throwing a fit at home. And if I put up enough of a fit, I can get out of this. It ain't gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. Well, and I, I don't think they understand that that sworn law enforcement officer, more so than anybody else, he's got something or she has something that nobody else has. And that is the ability, the legal ability, to temporarily suspend your freedom. The most precious thing beside faith and family. They can temporarily suspend your freedom. And whatever they say, if you don't like the way they look, if they look a little snotty, if they're not the right skin color, if they're a little overweight or underweight, too tall, too short, it doesn't matter. They have the ability to temporarily suspend your freedom. And whatever they say you have to do well and, and you know and they've got to understand that the officers they're just trying to serve a ticket trying to do their job yeah and again there there is a time to make that argument and, and i think from a law enforcement standpoint you know we always have to maintain and respect and obviously recognize constitutional rights of the individuals we're dealing with and so you know th there's that balance and that's one of the things we try to train our law enforcement officers you've been given a lot of power Yes. Uh, but we need to also use that discretion and, and do it correctly and, and, and not just, you know, escalate the situation ourselves. So that interaction with law enforcement and, and teaching about it early on, I, I think, is very important. And then, again, going back to training our officers, uh, you know, we, we have tried to make a greater emphasis on training. The Board of Law Enforcement Officer Standards and Training is being revised, and we're going to do a lot of things uh, pushing how, how do we improve those interactions from an education standpoint, uh, both for law enforcement and for drivers uh, on how to improve those situations. This is coming from somebody who's in the business, but was there anything in the bill that said uh, sponsorship could help with the cost of that from some adver advertising on the on the car? No, but, you know, that's a great idea, Paul. That's what sure. I love about coming on this show. You, you throw these yes. things out there, and I'm like, gosh, <laughs> why didn't I well, think I mean, of no, that? I mean, there are probably some insurance agents who would love to have, you know, a uh, sign on there. They could pot and boy. Maybe super talk on one of the cars. No, you never I think, know. I think that's a that's an right. excellent idea. And, and one of the things that I did think was important, and we're going to look at as part of the regulations on this, is mm -hmm. in that first uh, year when somebody has their learner permit, some sort of uh, magnet or, or tag or sticker that lets everybody know this is a student driver. Oh, absolutely. Uh, some states do that. Other countries do that so that, that every driver around can look and say, okay, this is a young driver. This is somebody I need to kind of keep an eye out for. Um, anything new as far as that came, that came out of the legislative session as far as Capitol Police? Uh, there was an expansion that will take effect uh, 
next July, making the district a, a little bit bigger. Um, and so we'll, next or this, uh, we, we will expand this July, and then there's a, another expansion that'll take pay, place the following July. So we're that, going to expand. That's July. the full expa- expansion next July <laughs> until maybe next year. So uh, you know, <laughs> I, I hope that uh, you know we, we will stick with this new line and, and for a while and, and not grow it anymore. We've got to get established in there, and it takes some time. And Chief Lucky and his team and Capitol Police have just done an excellent job. Proud of the work they've been doing uh but we, we kind of got to get established in, in this new area and, and then we'll look at uh where we go from here uh there was a bill that i think the governor vetoed dealing with uh ordinances and, and us enforcing um capital police enforcing and city ordinances um I, I think he had some issues and concerns with that and, and and i think the reality is when it comes to enforcing ordinances those aren't ordinances created by the legislature they're created by the city of jackson and and yeah. some of them we might not want any part of uh, when it comes to enforcement. Was, was that more of a technicality that could be cleared up in the next session? I think on, so. On that veto? I think so. And I, can, I think can, we hold, need to get Hold together. on for just a second, and let's uh, give you final thoughts when we come back. Okay, great. Back with the final segment with Sean Tindall, the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Uh, from C Spire Text Line, ten, uh, ten, <laughs> C Spire Text Line, whatever they say you have to do, Gallo, you're wrong. Well, I know that was a little harsh. I don't have a script to go by here. In, but I, it, it, what I really meant, and, and you ought to have to understand this, what legal command issued by a police officer at a stop can you ignore? Now, you have to answer that one. When I say something that's harsh, maybe, is whatever they say you have to command. We're talking about a good officer, not some uh, somebody who's going outside the law. But the, it was a little harsh to, to put it that way. But, again, the question is, what legal command that they give you, can you totally ignore? That's right. And and, and, and that's why I think we, we cleared it up and we talked about recognizing yes. the constitutional rights of individuals. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and that's something that we're, we're training our officers on constantly. Uh, but, you know, just for example, Mississippi law says that upon request uh, in a traffic stop, you, you have to show your driver's license. You have to display right. your driver's license to the officer. So Even if I'm driving, I'm not really driving, I'm just traveling. Well, if you're if the operator of the vehicle has to show that driver's license, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and so that way, again, uh, you, people watch YouTube and, and some states don't have that law. Uh, but if you're getting your law degree on YouTube and, and you think that's the law in Mississippi, you're wrong. And so, yeah. you know, you got to display your driver's license. And, and, and look, at, ultimately, at the end of the day, the officer just want to know who he's dealing with on, on this traffic stop. Uh, we have implied consent laws in our state, which, you know, basically state uh, if you're operating a motor vehicle uh, on those state uh, highways and byways, of the, uh, you have to uh, uh, subject yourself to uh, uh, DUI tests if there's probable cause. And in and, and that way. Um, our roads are safe, and, and it's a privilege to use the roads. It's not a constitutional right to use the roads to, to travel with an automobile. On this open container in the car, did you ever look at the books on that one? It's not a blue law somewhere stuck in there, is it? No. Um, you know, and, and that's one of the things that we've brought up a couple of times. Uh, Mississippi's uh, one of the, uh, if not the only state that, it's that, the only state. that, that uh, allows open containers. And so uh, ultimately, uh, that, that's something that I'm sure we'll be looking at and, and again, yeah. recommending uh, that we make some changes on. Um, you know, I can tell you that... Uh, you know, it, it's uh, we had a good session. I mean, really, we had a lot of great support in the legislature. Uh, Senator Harkins, uh, Senator Hobson, uh, Chairman Reed, and, and Chairman Lamar really helped us out on our budget. We got a pay raise for troopers, and I, I've talked to an NBN agents and, and really all our law enforcement. And, and what I, what I really talked about is, look, we're not trying to steal law enforcement officers from other agencies. Uh, what we want is competitive salaries across the board so that we can recruit new people into this profession. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've been supportive of, of those efforts. Uh, we got money for uh, to go out to Malota for law enforcement training and improve the facilities out there. Uh, Senator Harkins was, was instrumental in that as well as Representative Lamar. And so really appreciate their standing behind us. And I think what we've seen over the last four years, and I, and I think it was a U.S. News and World Report came out and had Mississippi rated, I think, number 17 in the nation in public safety. Um, and, and so I think some of the changes that we're making, uh, some of the efforts that we've put in place have really improved uh, the public safety in Mississippi and, and has us as a leader uh, instead of a lagger uh, nationwide. What's the the dates of the, the newest class as far as uh, highway patrol officers? 
They graduate next Thursday. Um, next so Thursday. next week we're going to have a very busy week. Uh, we have Cadet Class 68 will have its graduation on Thursday. And um, just ahead of Memorial Weekend. How uh, many did you start off with? We started off with about 70. Uh, so we'll finish with 29. Um, and and it's uh, you know it's a challenge. It's a tough course, uh, mm-hmm. but but we want to make sure that the ones we get out there are prepared and ready to take on the challenges that they're going to face. We still have that national competition. Uh, we have several. Um, you know, we've, of course, we got the physical fit uh, competition. We mm-hmm. have the NRA competition that that comes uh, annually out to Malota, and so. Um, you know, and those are good economic drivers for the Jackson Metro and the state when we when, when we hold those types of competitions at Melota. Um, and we take home some trophies every once in a while too, so that's good news. We do. We we've got some <laughs> top notch law enforcement officers all the way from wildlife and fisheries to highway patrol, NBN, Capitol Police, local yep. departments do do a great job. Um, it, it really is impressive. Next week we have our public safety summit. Uh, th- this will be the second one that we've done. Uh, it's a joint uh, effort with myself and Attorney General Lynn Fitch where we, we try to bring in sheriffs, police chiefs, state law enforcement, firefighters, uh, and just have public safety conversations and, and leadership discussions. And so uh, that, that's been a real positive. Good I think deal. we have about 400 registrants uh, that will be wow. coming to the Jackson Metro next week for that. Before I let you go, the next class is coming up. If somebody wants to take a look at this, uh, when do they need to get the information in? Uh, immediately. We're trying to set up an annual recruiting where we're recruiting year-round. Uh, and we've also um, done a trooper school every year of Governor Reeves' administration. Uh, he's been adamant that, that he thinks that's the pathway forward to grow in the ranks of the Highway Patrol and the Department of Public Safety is yeah. to have annual schools. Um, and so we're, we're starting recruiting as soon as this class graduates for the next class, and it'll start sometime in early uh, 2025. You are always most informative, sir. I thank you for taking the time. Well, thank you, Paul. It's always a pleasure. Good everybody, you, please man. stay safe. Memorial Weekend's coming up, and, and we want to see everybody go home to their families. I think and, they uh, said uh, 44 million people uh, are on the road this, uh, this Memorial Day, and they're probably going to be all right in front of you where you want to go.